Today's lecture on the start of the Cold War is brought to you by the definitive Cold War board game, Twilight Struggle. It was designed by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews, and this card-driven war game became the highest rated board game on Board Game Geek in June 2010. Now, personally, I've only played this game once, and it was a Saturday night during the summer, late. I played with an Army veteran for over three hours, and let me tell you, it was amazing. Also, it's coming to an iPad near you very soon, so keep an eye out for Twilight Struggle. Great game. Moving on, containment. Let's take a look at the State Department after World War II. The State Department is the part of our federal government that handles relations with other parts of the world. We get a new Secretary of State in 1947, and that's former General George C. Marshall. He is the top-ranking general in the U.S. military during World War II, so he kind of knows what he's doing. He's assisted in the State Department by Dean Acheson. He's the Under Secretary of State. He is really a firm believer in the fact that the United States is destined to replace Britain as the world power and feels that since we are a world power now that we should negotiate through a position of strength. We shouldn't be asking. We should be telling. And they're also assisted by George Kennan, who is the director of the policy planning staff. And he is a real expert on the Soviet Union. He's a Russian expert. And he's the guy who comes up with the idea or the phrase of containment. In fact, he's the first to use that term for referring to preventing the spread of communism. He writes an article in the uh, policy journal Foreign Policy. And he says that the United States should practice a policy of containment. They're not trying to wipe the Soviet Union out. They're not trying to change the Soviet Union's behavior, but they're trying to prevent communism from spreading. And in early 1947, the British, who had been active in Greece and preventing communism from taking over in Greece, informed the United States that they no longer can support Greece and nearby Turkey in their opposition to communism. Britain is just running out of money. World War II has been too hard on Great Britain. They need to think about themselves. They're pulling out of Greece. The State Department believes that communism in Greece and communism in Turkey could be disastrous. And if you take disastrous, and if you take a look at a world map, you'd see why. At this intersection, communism could easily spread to Africa. It could easily spread to Southwest Asia, in other words, the Middle East. It could easily spread to Europe. And the United States is the only nation in a position of power who could step in, who could step up, the only one who could do something about this. And this brings us to the Truman Doctrine. President Truman says that it must be the policy of the United States to support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressure. In other words, we are going to help democracies fight off communists. He gets congressional support for this. And he gets public support for this. And this becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. It's not the Monroe Doctrine. That's where we told Europe, stay out of the Western Hemisphere. This is the Truman Doctrine, saying that we will help democracies or democratic governments oppose communists. And we put our money where our mouth is, by providing money for military and economic assistance to Greece. But Greece isn't the only nation struggling. The Truman Doctrine and that belief is really put into widespread practice with what's called the Marshall Plan. This is a result of the problems in Western Europe, which is seen as the most important to the United States. This is where our big trading partners are. This is where our big allies against the Nazis are or were. But Western Europe is suffering from economic problems. Hunger is still a problem in many parts of Western Europe. Industry was destroyed during the war. Remember, World War II was a war of total war. So if you could limit your enemy's production capacity, you could improve your chances of winning the war. And both sides tried to do that. They are in an economic depression in Western Europe, really across all of Europe. And um, just the overall devastation and damage and loss of life from the wars 
uh, from World War II is still being felt. And then we have a horrible winter in 1947. And the overall concern in the United States State Department is that communism is going to be spreading in Western Europe. In fact, the Communist Party is gaining noticeable votes in both Italy and France, big important allies as we move into the Cold War. So what we do is offer money, economic power to halt that Soviet communist expansion. We offer economic aid for any nations that support political and social freedoms, democratic style governments. We also offer money to modernize their economy. And we also offer money to lower trade barriers, increase trade with us. The Soviet Union and all of Eastern Europe do not request US aid. They thought that this would be a way for the United States to gain control and influence over them. However, Western European nations like Italy, like France, like West Germany, like Switzerland, like Britain, all request aid from the United States. The State Department claims this could, in the long run, help American trade and help the American economy. Yeah, we're going to pay a little money up front, but we'll get it back tenfold when they can trade with us and when their production is up and running. Uh, this is also going to be an effective way to stop Soviet expansion. Congress waffles on this a little bit. Remember, wars are expensive, and we just fought a very, very expensive one against the Nazis and the Japanese. But in April of 1948, Czechoslovakia breaks out into a civil war. There's a conflict basically between the communists and non-communists in Czechoslovakia. And the Soviet Union's intervention in that conflict really scares Congress, and they approve the Marshall Plan. And it worked. It really revives and modernizes the economies and the industry of Western Europe. So the Marshall Plan, in that respect, is effective. All right, let's talk about NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. European nations want assurances from the United States that they will be protected by the United States. Remember, we've got a long-standing tradition of isolationism, especially of staying out of European affairs. Well, now we're left as the only world power, and the Soviet Union is a world power as well. European nations want our or want support from us. They want backing from us. They want to feel protected by us. And in April of 1949, most of the nations of Western Europe agreed to form a organization known as NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is the first treaty like it since the alliance with France in the 1700s. And the Senate ratifies this one. What did both of those treaties say? Well, like the treaty we had with France in the 1700s, the NATO treaty says this will be a treaty of mutual defense, meaning an armed attack against one will be considered an attack against all. Most importantly, the United States will consider an attack on any one of our allies as an attack on us or as an attack on all of our allies and may lead to an atomic weapon response. Well, that all sounds well and good, but is America really behind this? We know they never joined the League of Nations. Well, to make sure Europeans are certain that we are behind this, President Truman appoints Dwight D. Eisenhower, the hero of uh, World War II. This is the LeBron James of military generals. He appoints him as the supreme NATO commander and commits U.S. troops to Europe. In other words, he's going to send U.S. troops to Europe, and there will always be U.S. troops in Europe to deter any Soviet attack. An analogy might be we're coming together, kind of like the Dinobots come together, to form one big, awesome Monstructor Transformer. But on the flip side, you have the Constructicons forming this guy. So NATO is 
in some sense, seen as an unnecessary escalation of the Cold War. It's seen as an overreaction to Western European fears of Soviet aggression. There's really no evidence and no likelihood that the Soviets ever would have attacked Western Europe, that they were, would use military force to try to spread communism into Western Europe. And when the United States forms NATO, it puts the Soviet Union on high alert. It looks like a clenched fist aimed at them. And as a result, they form their own super alliance, no, not, as, not the Destructicons, but instead known as the Warsaw Pact. And those are almost all the countries of Eastern Europe allied with the Soviet Union in also a mutual defense treaty. 